Adam received his PhD from the School of Geography and Environment um, at the University of Oxford in 2016. He's previously worked as a researcher in the Department of Philosophy at UCL, as a teaching fellow in the Department of Sociology at the Uni of Warwick, and as a research associate in the Department of Geography at King's College London. He sits on the board of the Monitoring Group, an anti-racist organisation challenging state racism and racial violence. Adam is a friend of Kat as well, and he always, always, always brings some really interesting um, truth to our spaces. And so we're very much um, honoured to have him again, and we look forward to what he's about to say to us. So without further ado, Adam, the floor is yours. Okay, so policing and militarism. So where should we begin? So I think the reason that policing and militarism go together so well is because for most of the history of British policing, most British policing hasn't taken place on the British mainland. Um, it's taken place in Britain's colonies. It's taken place um, in Australia, um, across about a third of the African continent, uh, much of so um, South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, the Caribbean, a lot of a great deal of North America, uh, uh, what we now call the Middle East, a huge swathes of um, the planet's population and lands. And so when we think about the history of British policing, we have to understand it in the context of empire. And so what I'm going to do is begin by talking about the, um, that history of British policing, not the British policing of the British mainland, but the policing of Britain's colonies. And it's through that history that I think we can better understand the relationship between policing and militarism. Because here on the British mainland, there has always been, um, or historically, since the founding of the uh, Metropolitan Police and, or um, uh, the British Police in uh, 1829, there has been this very concerted effort to separate um, the police from the military. But in Britain's colonies, there has never been that distinction between the police and the military. In fact, the police and the military have always been one. Um, it's often referred to as what we might call paramil paramilitary policing or counterinsurgency policing, where we see the police and the military enmeshed as one singular um, unit of violence and control. And what I'm going to do is talk about the ways in which that logic of uh, colonial policing, in which the police and the military are one, has seeped into British policing in the post-war period, particularly um, following the, um, uh, the urban uprisings in black communities in the 1980s um, and also aided by um, workers' movements, particularly the miners' strike um, in the mid-1980s as well. Right, so let's, let's get into it, shall we? Okay, so quick slide on the history of the British Empire, very potted history of the British, history of the British Empire. Um, this is, this, I think this is always really important because Britain was founded in 1707, that's when uh, the Act of the Union was signed, and when the Act of the Union was signed, Scotland and um, uh, uh, England already had colonies, right? England already had colonial outposts in West Africa, of course it was engaging in the transatlantic slave trade, had colonial outposts therefore in the Caribbean and, and parts of North America, and of course in other parts of um, the colonised world as well, parts of um, uh, India and, and elsewhere. And even Scotland had colonies in um, Nova Scotia, um, in uh, West Virginia, and what would become, of course, the United States of America, and attempts to colonise Panama. So when the Act of the Union was signed in 1707, Britain, Britain already had colonies. So it's, I think it's useful to not think of Britain as a nation state, but to instead think about Britain as an imperial state. Britain has never existed without col um, colonial possessions. And so therefore, the governing of its colonial possessions, um, whether it be the enslaved African peoples um, in the Americas or um, uh, subjugated populations in India or Australia or, or parts of the African continent or elsewhere, that kind of the governing of those peoples has always been fundamental to British governance since Britain was established in 1707. Empire is as British as Britain is, is as Britain itself. And of course, one of the fundamental ways in which those colonised populations were governed, were controlled, were categorised, is, is through race and racism. Right? These, this, is the, this, is, this is a fundamentally important part of how Britain categorised people in order to better um, control them, in order to better um, exploit them, and, and at times also, of course, um, better uh, use violence, often fatal violence as well. 
Okay, so let's get on to policing. So I'm going to give three or four key case studies of policing across um, Britain's empire. Um, the ones that I begin with won't look very familiar um, uh, to um, what we might consider to be policing, but as time goes on, we'll see that they become uh, closer and closer to what we might consider um, uh, to be uh, policing as we know it. So the first example um, um, is uh, the example of um, Jamaica um, in, um, uh, in the early to mid 1800s. And so there are many examples here in which uh, Jamaica, uh, enslaved peoples in, um, in Jamaica and many other Caribbean colonies um, had corporal punishment and capital punishment imposed upon them by, by British colonial administrators um, and their um, uh, uh, and the the kind of military the militarized forces which were used to um, quell or repress um, uprisings among the enslaved peoples during the period of enslavement, but also the period after enslavement as well. Example number two um, is from the Indian subcontinent, um, fol uh, particularly following in the mid 1800s we, again we see corporal and capital punishment being used by um, by british uh, military slash police forces rounding up suspects of um uh, who are dissidents against the british colonial um, administration and using corporal and capital punishment often in quite uh, spectacular um, uh, uh, methods the third example um is from uh, british colonial kenya um, and so uh, in the 1940s and 1950s up until the early 1960s, we begin to see um, British policing um, in colonial Kenya, rounding up hundreds of thousands of uh, people from the Kikuyu ethnicity, suspected of being part of what they call the Mau Mau uprising. So a, a, an uprising against um, the British um, uh, uh, in this particular, in this, in this post-war period, imprisoning large numbers of them and torturing many of them and, and many of them being sentenced to death or indeed um, being killed um, in these uh, large prison camps set up uh, by the British. And so there are three, um, I would say three kind of, um, so three or four kind of broad areas in which we should understand this context of British colonial policing. Um, there are, so the first is that um, the police and military were indistinguishable. So if the British police were rounding up people um, who they suspected of being dissidents um, or suspected of uh, avoiding uh, colonial taxes or any other discretion or criminality, um, this, this is what we might associate with normal kinds of, of, of policing we might be familiar with. But then the kinds of um, tactics and weaponry that they deployed was very much militaristic. So of course they, these 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 um, police, forms of policing were often almost always armed um, and they use these they use a, a number of specific kind of tactics so these tactics include mass surveillance so using different kinds of surveillance technologies to control people that might be that might involve moving large numbers of people into set um, uh, villages or areas so they can be monitored more closely um, in the context of India under the um, criminal tribes act people had their um, foreheads tattooed so they could be more closely monitored by the British colonial administration. The other thing that's often used um, are, are forms of uh, mass, um, not simply mass surveillance, but, but mass punishment, so collective punishment. So you can see that in, these, in these examples, if a small number of people, or even a large number of people, rebel against the British, enormous numbers of people will be punished in response, entire villages, entire communities, or even entire ethnic um, or national groups um, being punished. So mass punishment um, or collective punishment is a really important example of this. And we saw that in, um, in the paper um, on gangs and um, uh, policing in contemporary London. So, so it's both the tactics um, that they use, um, mass surveillance, collective punishment, the weaponry that they use, um, uh, of course, uh, being armed and using those kinds of technologies, and the harshness um, of this of these kinds of regimes as well. Mass kinds of punishments, um, uh, the suspension of the rule of law, um, suspension of civil liberties, and these types of things as well. Right. So we've got up to the 1960s now, whistle stop tour of um, of the British Empire and policing. So, but of course, um, in the post-war period, something else important happens. People from Britain's colonies begin to migrate to Britain in significant numbers. Um, of course, people had lived there before, but um, from Britain's colonies, but it's, we start to see sig significant numbers of black people migrating to the British mainland um, in the post-war period. And so 
the kinds of thinking, the kind of racist thinking, which had justified the violence, the control, um, and the policing of uh, colonial subjects during the colonial period, begins to migrate to Britain as those people migrate to Britain in significant numbers in the post-war period. And you can see some examples on your screen um, of the kinds of racialized stereotypes that we saw migrating to Britain in the 1960s and 70s. Stowaways, drifters, pimps, drug dealers, muggers, illegal immigrants, black extremists, Rastafarians, and the, uh, Paul Gilroy calls those black folk devils. And so, in so we, what we begin to see um, in the post-war period isn't sim um, is um, the kind of racist thinking which justified, which sanctioned, which helped to govern the uh, colonised populations in previous decades and centuries. We begin to see that kind of racist thinking being used here on the British mainland in quite significant ways. Right. So, what does that lead to? What does that mean? So one of the one of the things that it means um, uh, was analysed by um, Stuart Hall and a number of his colleagues in the 1970s. Um, and here's um, a, a quote from uh, Kenneth Newman, Sir Kenneth Newman, I should say, uh, the former head of the Metropolitan Police. And I think his view really helps to encapsulate um, what this um, the kind of racist policing that we see emerging on the British mainland. Um, really means. And he says that uh, the black inner city areas are a challenge to British policing um, uh, because they, the police can no longer police with the consent of the community. Kenneth Newman says the police find themselves ill-prepared, although for the best reasons, to cope with recent immigrant groups whose own history and culture has thus inculcated them with the law-abiding and respectable values of the British people. And I think this is a really important quote because in a very twisted way, Kenneth Newman is right. Because the people from, who have lived under British colonial rule haven't lived in a system of policing by consent. That hasn't been the system in which they've lived. They've lived under a system of coercion, of violence, of, of a militarised form of policing, which hadn't been used on the British mainland up until that point. But yet, of course, that doesn't mean that the people from Britain's colonies didn't have law-abiding and respectable values, right? So, this, so um, the fact that they had, they had they'd lived under such brutal colonial regimes um, doesn't mean that they were wayward um, and uh, didn't necessarily respect um, laws and other uh, moral principles. Uh, but this is, the, this is what, of course, Kenneth Newman, head of the Metropolitan Police, is inferring um, in the 1970s and 80s. So we begin in militarised forms of policing emerging on the British mainland in 1980 um, as an idea. So in 1980 we have urban uprisings um, in two areas of the country, um, in Nottingham and in Bristol. Um, and it's following these um, particular uprisings emerging from uh, the racist policing of black communities in the 1970s, particularly following what were called the SUS laws, so the laws of, uh, to stop and search people um, on suspicion of carrying out an offence, um, as well as the, the raids on uh, homes and, and black businesses, that we begin to see these urban rebellions and, and, and the British police begin to say that they need something different, they need something new to deal with these black inner city uh, communities. And so what they do is they go to two different police forces to get advice on how to deal with these black communities. The first is um, the Royal Ulster Constabulary in Ireland, and the second is the Royal Hong Kong Police. And so Ireland and um, Hong Kong are the two places they go. And this is important. This, I think this is, this is interesting and relevant, of course, because these are two of Britain's remaining significant colonies by 1980. And what, the, what these two colonial police forces offer are a number of different um, tactics and weapons that they can use. Uh, tear gas, pepper spray, um, uh, baton rounds or rubber bullets, um, and, and, and new kinds of police armaments. So the kind of riot shields, extra long batons, um, and, 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 and armour to use um, against uh, these black communities. And they also offer tactics, the tactics of mass surveillance of these communities, suspect communities, ideas such as mass arrest. Um, and so we see these kinds of tactics being used for the first time in Toxteth and Moss Side a year later, when similar kinds of urban 
urban rebellions um, arise. And so we see the tactics of mass arrest, of mass um, the surveillance of these communities, but also a, tactic, a key tactic used both in Northern Ireland and in Hong Kong, which is the tactic of driving a number of large police vans into a crowd of people in order to attempt to disperse them. Um, this was this first took place in Moss Side, and the police no no sorry this first took place in Toxteth. Um, in 1981 and then later in Moss Side and it was in Toxteth where a young um, a man um, who, was, who had a disability um, was killed by the police when they were using this method. Despite this police killing it was then used again um, in Moss Side. Um, these kind of tactics were also de then deployed um, during the mine strike in the 1880s um, and so we see this relationship between race and class here. Um, and then we see it coming to a head in urban rebellions again in 1985, where uh, for the first time in the British mainland, baton rounds are taken to a, a um, uh, following an urban uprising in Broadwater Farm Estate in Tottenham in North London. Although um, the police don't actually use rubber bullets, they just bring them uh, to the scene. But again, we see it CCS spray um, used as it was in Toxteth um, uh, four years uh, previously, as well as, as you can see from the picture on your left, the, the new kinds of uh, militarised forms of armament that the police are able to use as well. But we also, of course, see, um, as I mentioned, mass surveillance and mass arrest. So following the rebellions of 1985, you see hundreds of people being arrested hundreds of people being charged um, and um, and I don't have time to go into it but huge numbers of people also being accused of crimes that they hadn't committed, um, huge numbers of people being accused of offensive, large numbers, hundreds of people having their homes being raided, schools being raided and children taken out of school and arrested. The kinds of tactics that were far more familiar to the kinds of policing that were being deployed in Britain's colonies during the colonial period including Kenya and the Caribbean and, and India and Ireland and other places as well. Right, okay, um, haven't got long left, so I'm going to uh, skip through as quickly as I can. So um, when we think about policing today um, uh, and the militarized, these militarised forms of policing, I, I'm going to talk about the, the, the less militarised forms of policing, which are very much connected to the militarised forms of policing. So one of the ones we're my, my, probably most familiar with, of course, stop and search. Um, People are probably, un un most people here are probably familiar with that black people are considerably more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs in this country. Um, but even if they're found with drugs, um, they're more likely to be charged than their white counterparts as well. So when white people are found with drugs, they're le more likely to be less of a caution than charged. When black people are found with drugs, they're significantly more likely to be charged than less of a caution. Um, I'm gonna skip that terrible text. Okay, one last bit on institutional racism. Um, a lot of the discourse we've seen here, um, we see today, is around gangs, and that's what one of the readings that we looked at focused upon. And so the policing of gangs has been hugely important for the, um, the reproduction of racist policing. Um, it was this, and it's this idea that black communities are kind of cesspits of violence, of, of nihilism, um, what that, need, that require a punitive kind of policing, a violent form of policing, a coercive form of policing in order to repress this almost essential inherent violence. Um, uh, this is a lovely uh, uh, newspaper uh, head, uh, double, uh, um, double page spread from the sun. And so a number of um, uh, researchers uh, based in Manchester were interested in looking at um, uh, the policing of these gangs and London's Metropolitan Police and the Greater and Greater Manchester Police have um, gangs databases of the people they've identified as being involved in a gang as in, being involved in a gang. So they went to the uh, Greater Manchester Police and London's Metropolitan Police and said, can we have your gangs database broken down, down by ethnicity please? Oh, nearly done. Broken down by ethnicity please. Yep. And they said, yep, sure, here you go. And then they said, okay, so how do you define a gang member? What is a gang member? And they said, it's anyone who's involved in serious youth violence. They said, okay, great. So can we have everyone involved in serious youth violence that you've identified and have that broken down by a fisty please? Yeah, sure, here you go. Um, and this is what they found. They found that in Manchester, in the top two pie charts, 89% of the gangsters were black, Asian or minority ethnic, according to the police's records, and only 11% were white. Yet when it comes to serious youth violence, 77% of the serious youth violence in Manchester was carried out by white people, and only 23% was carried out by black and Asian or minority ethnic young people. Over in London, 80% of London's gang members were uh, black or Asian, whereas only 20% were white. When it came to serious violence, it was 50-50, which is roughly proportionate with London's youth population. 
When we look at black and non-black, it's even the figures, figures are even more stark, with 81% of Manchester's gangsters being black, yet black people only managing to carry out 6% of Manchester's serious youth, youth violence, according to Greater Manchester Police. And um, in London, 72% of the purported gangsters in London are black, yet have only carried out 27% of the serious youth violence, the purported the criteria for which gang members are identified. So what does this tell us? What this doesn't tell us is that police officers sit in dimly lit rooms scheming against black people um, to put them onto their gang's database because they're such horrible bigots. What it does tell us is that the police are institutionally racist. That means the normal functioning of policing produces racist outcomes. And the reason that the normal functioning of policing produces racist outcomes isn't because racism has been fundamental to policing for years or for decades or for generations. It's because racism has been fundamental to British policing for centuries. And because most, as I mentioned before, most of British policing hasn't taken place here on the British mainland. It's taken place in Britain's colonies. And to understand the militarism and the racism which has which has escalated in British on the British mainland since the post-war period, we have to understand the racism and militarism of policing in Britain's colonies, which goes back centuries. Um, and therefore we should be unsurprised that the prison population in this country has almost doubled in the last 30 years with um, uh, black and Asian people, black and Asian minority ethnic people making up a quarter of Britain's prison population and black people incarcerating, Britain, Britain incarcerating black people at the same rate as African Americans are incarcerated in the United States. And I'll leave it there because I'm over time.